Good day. This is a brief video, a shortish video I'm going to do, following reports that the Chinese Foreign Ministry has actually denied that the Chinese did in fact test a hypersonic glide vehicle on Sunday. Um, the reported statements of the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman are as follows, and I'm going to read them out in full since they are actually quite interesting. And what they say is as, follow, as, follow, uh, as follows. Now, these comments were made over the course of a press conference held on Monday, and they were in response to questions provided by, made by Bloomberg and by the AFP, the Agence France Press news agencies. Now, the first question was from Bloomberg. Uh, the Financial Times has reported that China tested a nuclear-capable hypersonic missile. Could the foreign ministry confirm if China has such a missile? And then the foreign ministry spokesman, Zhao Lixian, responded as follows. As we understand, this was a routine test of space vehicle to verify technology of spacecraft's reusability. It is of great significance to reduce the cost of using space vehicle and providing a convenient and cheap way for mankind's two-way transportation in the peaceful use of space. Several companies, companies around the world have conducted similar tests. After separating from the space vehicle before its return, the supporting devices will burn up when it's falling in the atmosphere and the debris will fall into the high seas. China will work with other countries in the world for the peaceful use of space for the benefit of mankind. That answer then provoked a further question from AFP. Is the missile you mentioned the same missile reported by the Financial Times? And then Zhao Lixian said in response, as I just said, it's not a missile, but a space vehicle. So that was the response from the Chinese Foreign Ministry. Now, when I uh, read that response, I found it extremely unconvincing in terms of the detail of the Financial Times story. And I published a brief video on the uh, on our locals platform in which I explained why I thought this account was unconvincing. Anyway, more information has now come to light and I can now actually say I think with a very high degree of confidence that this is not a denial of any kind of what actually took place in August. In fact, it's a classic example of a foreign ministry spokesman unwilling to make a straightforward denial, but changing the topic to something different. Now, I say that, and here I would like to take the opportunity to uh, acknowledge my debt on this point to the Moon of Alabama blog. Um, the blogger there, I believe his name is Bernhardt, has published a piece about the Chinese uh, test, one which I'm going to refer to, and one which on some extremely important points I don't agree with, by the way. But he did draw attention to the fact that back in July, China did actually make a public test of a reusable space vehicle. And there's, in fact, a link which he's provided, which shows that China did, in fact, conduct such a test. It's from um, the war zone one of the endless number of US publications that inhabit and congregate the internet, produced either by various um, Beltway think tanks, almost always, by the way, of a neocon persuasion, or occasion and occasionally from various entities and groupings connected either to the US military or to the US military industrial complex. Anyway, um, this this piece, actually it's not the war zone, it's the drive, my correction. Um, this piece details, and it's an article that was written on the 16th of July 2021, it details at some length the fact that the Chinese had just tested a reusable space vehicle. And the article reads in part as follows, I'm not going to cover the whole of it, 
the state-run China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, or CASC, released a statement earlier today stating that it had successfully carried out the first suborbital test of a reusable space vehicle that can land in a similar fashion to a traditional plane. Details about the test and the space plane itself are limited, but CASC has been publicly working on such technologies ostensibly for commercial use for years now and had previously said it expected to carry out such a flight test last year. A Chinese language statement from CASC said that it had launched the space plane from the Jichuan Satellite Launch Center, which sits in a part of the Gobi Desert in China's Inner Mongolia region. And then there's more details in the article. You'll find a link under this video about the test. And it's a test, as I said, which took place in July. So there was a test by the Chinese of a reusable space vehicle in July. What does that have to do with the test of what the Americans say was a hypersonic glide vehicle, which took place in August? The answer is absolutely nothing. Let's now go back to the comments of the Chinese foreign ministry official and uh, Mr. Zhao Lixian, and we'll see exactly what happened. So the fun let's go back. There was the Financial Times question, uh, the, the Bloomberg question about the Financial Times article. And it reads as follows. The Financial Times has reported that China tested a nuclear capable hypersonic missile. Could the foreign ministry confirm if China has such a missile? And then Zhao Lixian says, as we understand. Note. A careful word, use the word understand. It's not a question of whether they know or don't know. Presumably the foreign ministry actually does know, but he is careful to use the conditional word understand. This was a routine test of a space vehicle to verify technology of spacecraft's reusability. It is of great significance to reducing the cost of using space vehicles and providing a convenient and cheap way for mankind's two-way transportation in the peaceful use of space. Several companies around the world have conducted similar tests. After separating from the space vehicle before its return, the supporting devices will burn up when it's falling in the atmosphere and the debris will fall into the high seas. China will work with other countries in the world for the peaceful use of space for the benefit of mankind. And then the question from AFP, is the missile you mentioned the same missile reported by the Financial Times? And Zhao Lixian comes back and says, as I just said, it's not a missile, but a space vehicle. In fact, what Zhao Lixian is doing, what the Chinese are doing, is that without actually denying the test in August of the hypersonic glide vehicle, they are talking instead about the completely different test of the reusable space vehicle, which took place a month earlier in July. And that's where we get all these comments about the routine test of a space vehicle, uh, uh, a vehicle uh, whose technology is focused on reusability. The AFP journalist was clearly not taken in. He asked, is the missile you mentioned the same missile reported by the Financial Times? In other words, are you actually talking about what the Financial Times is reporting? Or are you talking about the earlier test, the one that took place of the reusable vehicle in July? And Zhao Lixian gets around that by rather cleverly focusing on that word missile. Because, of course, neither the hypersonic glide vehicle, which was tested in August, nor the reusable space vehicle, which was tested in Ju July, neither of these objects is, in fact, a missile. So he says, as I said, it's, just, it's not a missile, but a space vehicle. So he is correcting an error in the AFP uh, questioner's question. 
he is not actually answering the underlying question whether, in fact, what he's talking about there is indeed the August test of the hypersonic glide vehicle as opposed to the test of the reusable space vehicle in July. Now, I would say that the technology, I suspect, of the two is probably probably contains significant overlaps and um, that might partly explain why the Chinese have been able to make so much progress with both. But let's put all that aside. I'm not a type scientist or a technologist and I'm not going to go into that in any detail. The fact that the Chinese foreign ministry spokesman is engaging in this rather clever game of answering the wrong question um, is, to my mind, a further very strong sign that the Financial Times article is true. It note that there is no outright or clear-cut denial. Zhao Lixian is not reported as saying straightforwardly the Financial Times article is wrong. There was no test of a hypersonic glide vehicle by China. Instead, Zhao Lixian talks at some length about an entirely different test in July, giving the impression that he's denying something where, in fact, he's talking about something else. It's the sort of thing, by the way, that one shouldn't criticise the Chinese too much about. It happens in many places all the time, and it's uh, the sort of thing that spokesmen of foreign ministries often do. As I discussed in my previous programme, if you read the Global Times article, you will find that the, the, the whole Global Times editorial, which I discussed in my previous video, you will see that, again, in that long editorial, the Chinese neither admit nor deny the hypersonic glide vehicle test. They leave the question open, and they do so in a way that then segues into a discussion about the fact that the United States faces a deteriorating geostrategic picture. Anyway, that's what I'm going to say about this particular um, comments of the Chinese foreign ministry. As we can see, there hasn't really been a denial of the hypersonic glide vehicle test. And unless some earth-shaking revelation comes out that everybody is lying, both the Chinese and the Americans, and that the Chinese foreign ministry spokesman's comments actually mean a great deal more than uh, they appear to do, well, I'm going to assume from now on that such a test did indeed happen, and that's, I think, probably the safe assumption to make. I would add that the Moon of Alabama blog appeared to acknowledge as much. He too, Bernhardt, uh, writes, that, uh, writes in it, um, quite interestingly, that it's not entirely clear whether the Chinese, whether the, uh, to, to use his words, it is not assured that the Financial Times report and the Chinese account he's referring to the Chinese Foreign Ministry's minister, uh, Ministry spokesman's comments refer to the same system. Anyway, let's just now comment briefly on a further part of the Moon of Alabama's um, article. I said that there were some parts of it with which I did not agree. This particular uh, point, which I do not agree with, relates specifically to his discussion of a system known as FOBS, Fractional Orbital Bombardment System, which, as he correctly says, was initiated, development of which was initiated by the United USSR, the Soviet Union, in the 1960s. And um, he gives an account of what this amounts to, and he says that FOBS, to use its well-known expression, was a nuclear weapons delivery system developed in the 1960s by the Soviet Union, one of the first Soviet efforts to use space to deliver weapons. FOBS envisaged launching nuclear warheads into low Earth orbit before bringing them down on their targets. Like a kinetic bombardment system, but with nuclear weapons, 
FOBS had several attractive qualities. It had no range limit, its flight path would not reveal the target location, and warheads could be directed to North America over the South Pole, evading detection by NORAD. NORAD is the US um, um, anti-ballistic missile warning system, north-facing early warning systems. Well, FOBS did indeed exist. It was a major program that the Soviet Union launched in the 1960s. It was never actually, to my knowledge, uh, uh, properly deployed. Though the Soviets did arrive at a point in the mid-70s where it could have been deployed and might have become a reusable system. And as uh, Bernhardt, the moon of Alabama, correctly says, it wasn't one of the reasons it wasn't deployed was because the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which came in in 1972, meant that the concerns that the Soviets had that the United States would counter Soviet intercontinental ballistic missiles with anti-ballistic missile interceptors, that concern went away so that there was no need for FOBs anymore. However, there were other problems with FOBs which the moon of Alabama, Bernhardt, doesn't actually discuss. And in fact, it's debat debatable to what extent the Soviets would have persisted with it. I say that because FOBS recently was discussed quite extensively in the Russian media a few years ago in connection with Russia's development of, the new, of its new heavy intercontinental ballistic missile. The Sarmat. The Sarmat is able to be launched from Russia and can uh, uh, circumvent the globe. It can actually um, cross the South Pole and hit targets um, in the United States um, from a southward trajectory, uh, doing exactly what the FOBS system of the 1960s and 1970s could do, look, strike at the United States, the continental United States, from the south, circumventing NORAD's early warning systems. But, uh, and when, as I said, Nor uh, SARMAP was um, displayed, there was some discussion, as I remember at the time, that perhaps SARMAP was able to do that because the Soviets were, or rather the Russians, were reviving the earlier so uh, FOBS system and there was some speculation that the Sarmat missile carried FOBS warheads. Well, we, this led to a, a fair amount of discussion within Russia about FOBS and we learnt from this discussion that in fact Sarmat does not carry FOBS type warheads um, it is the missile itself that has this capability to circumvent the globe. But the reason why, one reason why it doesn't have FOBs is because the Russians, and the, rather to be more precise, the Soviets, when they developed FOBs in the 60s and 1970s, found that it was unreliable and potentially dangerous. It proved extremely difficult to control these warheads when they were in low Earth orbit. The systems for command and control were uh, um, stretched beyond the limits of um, possible technology, even at that, uh, both at that time and apparently even today. And the system suffered from inherent reliability issues. Um, as a Russian military official, to my knowledge, actually said, in order to ensure reliability of a strategic deterrent system, it's much better to launch the missile and the warhead directly from the ground within Russia itself, rather than take the extraordinarily difficult and inherently unreliable step of trying to position the vehicle, the, the uh, warhead in low Earth orbit. The risks of things going wrong are catastrophically high and the system suffers from too many problems to be viable. So the Soviets scrapped FOBs partly for that reason and the Russians 
aware of the technical problems better perhaps than anyone else, have decided that they're not interested in going down that route again. Anyway, so much for fobs. The point to say is that clearly what was tested by China in August, despite what Bernhardt says, was not a fobs system. It's clearly a, 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 a from the Financial Times article's discussion, a hypersonic glide vehicle. Uh, a hypersonic glide vehicle is not a flop FOBS system. War, it's not a FOBS warhead. It doesn't. Um, uh, it isn't based. It isn't delivered into the uh, um, in into space and um, f fall and sort of under sort of kin and as a kind of kinetic bombardment system. It is, if you like, a kind of plane, a glide vehicle that flies at extraordinary speeds through the atmosphere after it's been launched by an intercontinental ballistic system. I think what has, miscon what has caused the misunderstanding, Bernhardt's misunderstanding of the Chinese system is very simply that the Financial Times has reported the um, system, the Chinese test, as having circumvented the globe, which makes it sound a little bit like a FOBS warhead. But clearly, that's not the case. There are other errors in that Financial Times article. Clearly, the person who wrote it is not somebody who is fully technically on top of these things. And it's quite clear that the system that was developed and tested by China in August is completely different from the Soviet FOBS system of the 1970s. Rather, and instead, it is a system that was developed um, in, th that is uh, more similar to the contemporary Russian avant-garde hypersonic glide vehicle, which also functions as a warhead of an intercontinental ballistic missile. So there we are. <laughs> it's a non-denial from the Chinese foreign ministry spokesman. In effect, I would go even further than that. I'd say essentially a, a, a sort of cack-handed indirect admission when somebody, as I said, instead of talking about one thing, talks about something else. Well, you know that he's not denying that the truth of uh, the of the first thing, and as I said, not a FOBS system at all, a hypersonic glide vehicle, right like the Russian avant-garde, and as I've discussed in previous programs, a high possibility that this Chinese vehicle and the avant-garde system might be related to each other in some way. Anyway, so much for that. Why are the Chinese engaging in all these evasions? Why don't they come forward straightforwardly and openly and confirm what the Americans told us, uh, t are telling us is through this indirect route of an article in the Financial Times? Why aren't the Chinese simply saying, yes, we did in fact test a hypersonic glide vehicle in August? After all, that is apparently what they did. And one might have expected that it would be the sort of thing that the Chinese would want to talk about. The explanation for this is firstly that the Chinese do not talk at all about the strategic nuclear deterrent force. They've not, for example, discussed the silo construction programs that the United States has talked about, and they've not said very much about their entire nuclear forces posture. They are keeping everything about it not exactly secret, because the extent to which there can be secrets in this world is, um, frankly, debatable, given that the two other nuclear superpowers, the United States and Russia, have all the technical means to be fully aware of much of what is going on. The reason the Chinese don't want to talk about this is diplomatic. And there is, in fact, here a very clear diplomatic imperative. What the Chinese do not want is to be put in a position where they are, in effect, admitting that their strategic nuclear deterrent is developing into something comparable to the nuclear deterrents of the United States and of Russia.
The reason they don't want that to happen is because they do not want to be put in a position where the Americans can argue that the Chinese nuclear uh, uh, program, nuclear strategic program, is inherently destabilizing and that its growth necessitates and requires that China should join arms limitation talks. The Chinese have resolutely refused to be drawn into arms limitation talks with the United States. Their argument is that there is no purpose or point in their doing so because they have only a small, minimal deterrent one that is only a fraction of the size and power of the nuclear deterrent forces of the United States and Russia, and therefore there is no purpose or logic in China becoming involved in arms limitation talks. And that is very much the position the Chinese are making, and they do not want to give the impression that, in fact, they are upgrading their nuclear deterrent capability in a way that would undermine their public diplomatic stance that might make it seem that in fact they're having it both ways. They're saying that their nuclear deterrent is only a fraction of the power of that of the United States, even as they are developing a nuclear deterrent which is increasingly powerful and which has the reach to launch attacks upon the continental United States. So it is a position that the Chinese are taking, not, I suspect, an entirely comfortable or easy one, in which, in order to improve their diplomatic positioning, they are pretending to have a less potent nuclear deterrent capability than the one they actually have. Now, I wonder how much longer this pretense will continue. The Taiwanese defence minister, as I discussed in a recent programme, uh, has indicated that by 2025, uh, China will be in a position where it can launch a military strike and uh, uh, attack on Taiwan and storm and reconquer the island. Um, and it's possible that at that point, if China feels that some kind of military action with respect to Taiwan is needed, it will come um, out and speak openly about the potency of its nuclear deterrent force, and then it will confirm the nature of, of that force and the capabilities, the multiple capabilities which it possesses. The Chinese, as I've just discussed in my previous video, have made it very clear that as far as they're concerned, their quest for technological um, upgrading in terms of their nuclear deterrent capability is not aimed at replacing the United States as the world's greatest nuclear or military power. It is to provide China with insurance so that it cannot be threatened by the United States in the event that there is a showdown between China and the United States and their conventional forces in Taiwan uh, or on the East, East and South China Seas. So given that this is so, given that all of this is so linked to the question of Taiwan, it seems to me logical and understandable that the Chinese would want to announce the full capability of their strategic nuclear deterrent force sometime around the point when they feel that they have completed their preparations and are ready to launch an attack on Taiwan or are prepared to take action in the South or East China Seas, something which, by the way, it doesn't mean that they would necessarily want to do those things, but which would put them in a position when they could do it. In other words, I expect the Chinese to continue this game of um, evasion and non-denial until for a couple of years more, until about 2025, 
when, as I said, the incentive at that point to come clean and to be straightforward and say straightforwardly, yes, we do have uh, several hundred uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and yes, they do possess hypersonic glide vehicle warheads. Uh, that will be the point when I think they will be prepared to come forward and to say that. Now, there is a way, as I said, of the United States um, preventing that situation from arising. The United States is currently involved in what are turning out to be exceptionally difficult negotiations with the Russians on what the United States calls strategic stability. Note that the United States talks about strategic stability. It doesn't talk about arms control. The Russians are talking about arms control, but the Americans instead are talking about strategic stability. The reason the Americans want to talk about strategic stability with the Russians as opposed to arms control is because the Russians insist, as I discussed again in my previous video, on arms control on an equal basis. The Americans interpret strategic stability as a situation completely different from that, one in which the United States has equal nuclear forces to those of China and Russia combined. The Russians are not prepared to accept that, nor, of course, are the Chinese. And that is why these talks that are going on between the Russians and the Americans are proving so difficult and so protracted. But it could be if the United States is prepared or were prepared to make the necessary concessions, if it were willing to agree that geostrategic ceasefire that I've talked about in so many programs and which both the Chinese and the Russians have said quite openly that they would be open, open towards, it would be possible, I think, if the United States were to come forward now for the United States to agree with the Chinese Yes, China can have its sphere, its zone of interest in the South China and East China Seas and in Taiwan. And in return, the Chinese would not press ahead with development of these systems of their hypersonic glide vehicles and their more sophisticated intercontinental ballistic missile systems, and I suspect also of these Chinese sea-launched uh, uh, ballistic missile systems and the nuclear-powered submarines that go with them. I, I think if the United States were to make that decision today to negotiate with China in good faith on all of these issues, these weapon systems that we see the Chinese now testing, they might not necessarily ever be deployed. That's, however, not going to happen, because as of this moment in time, there is no willingness or ability in the United States to negotiate with China on those sort of terms. As we've seen, what we've had instead are a series of disastrous meetings between US and Chinese officials, between people like uh, Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan and Wendy Sherman on the one hand, and Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, and Yang Chiechi, the uh, director of the Chinese government's uh, foreign relations uh, committee. In effect, in other words, uh, Xi Jinping's uh, national security advisor. We've seen a whole succession of these disastrous meetings in which the United States comes along tries to get the Chinese to talk about things that the United States is interested in, but is not prepared to move on issues like Taiwan, on the South China Sea, or on the East China Sea, or any of those things. Instead, we've had these reckless and irresponsible statements from the State Department and from Tony Blinken, talking about values, America defending its values, talking about how America's commitment to Taiwan is rock solid, and also talking about how Taiwan is an ally of the United States, and speaking of it as a, democr a democratic Taiwan, implying that it has a legitimate alternative political system 
to that of the rest of China. We've seen these reckless statements and there's no sign that the United States is prepared to back off that kind of inflammatory and foolish language. And the reason this is foolish is because the Chinese, as a result, are going to go ahead and complete development of these systems and are going to deploy them. They will indeed, before very long, have more intercontinental ballistic missiles. I am convinced that those silos are not being built purely for decoration or as some sort of bluff. I am sure that they are intended eventually to house more of those missiles. And in those missiles will indeed have hypersonic glide vehicle warheads. And all of this will happen as the Chinese build more aircraft carriers, build more uh, nuclear submarines, build more amphibious warfare uh, ships, including helicopter carriers, of which they're now starting to build increasing numbers. And we will see a situation arise where the Chinese finally have that overwhelming superiority along the Taiwan Straits, the East China and South China Seas that the Chinese are talking about and say that they are seeking. And at that point, what does the United States do? Well, I'm going to say straightforwardly that there will at that point be, I suspect, some sort of a negotiation. If the Chinese, for example, decide at that point that they're going to uh, re reoccupy Taiwan and are going to activate their military forces, given that the United States realistically is not going to send the US Navy to be destroyed by Chinese anti-ship missiles, also, by the way, equipped with hypersonic glide vehicles. Um, well, at that point, the United States will have to back off and it will be humiliated. And if it is not humiliated, if it tries to negotiate with the Chinese to do some kind of deal that will avoid a war and a military catastrophe over Taiwan, well, at that point, of course, the Chinese price will be far steeper than it is now, than it would be now. And the same, of course, applies to Russia over Ukraine. Now, I have discussed this again in various programmes, including programmes I've done on locals, about how the Russians are now taking an exceptionally hard line on Ukraine-related topics. They've ruled out negotiating with the Ukrainian government. They're insisting that the Minsk agreement must be fulfilled in full. They are showing no sign of movement or, uh, 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 or, or are wishing to budge on the hardest possible line that they're taking with the West. And the same applies in respect of Belarus. And the Russians have now, just today, as I make this video, confirmed that from their point of view, um, Ukraine's membership of NATO is a red line and that they will take military action to prevent Ukraine from joining NATO. The actual word used is active measures, but in fact that effectively means military action. And that was confirmed by Putin's spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, in an interview he gave on French television. And in the meantime, the Russians have also closed down all their contacts with NATO and are now saying that if NATO wants to discuss some topic with Russia as an organisation, it will have to do so by asking one of the embassies of one of the NATO member states in Moscow to contact the foreign ministry. The Russians are not prepared to talk to NATO either. And the reason for that is, again, as I've discussed in my previous video, that the Russians are steadily gaining a position of military superiority in the territories around their borders. Now, again, I want to make this very clear. I'm not saying or suggesting or implying that the Russian military is going to be powerful enough to conquer the whole of Europe. That is an absurd idea, and that's certainly not one that the Russians entertain. I am talking about dominating the immediate area around Russia itself, the borderlands, Ukraine, Belarus, the Baltic states, the Black Sea, 
already the Russians are in a dominant position uh, um, along those territories, those, those regions. By 2025, their position will become even stronger. There's a whole new range of military systems coming online in Russia. We've learned that the T-14 Armata tank, for example, has now started entering service after a protracted development program. Um, it's apparently now uh, being deployed by the Russian military this year. The Russians are uh, now starting to field Suhoi 57 stealth fighter jets. And of course, much more importantly, as well as on top of all of these uh, systems that we're hearing about, they are pressing forward with their hypersonic technologies, the technologies which they have developed, which extend beyond hypersonic glide vehicles to um, scramjet powered vehicles and rocket systems, which provide the Russians with hypersonic systems that they can use with, for tactical purposes, for tactical uh, combat applications in actual battlefields. And again, one has to say that with all the confusion and muddle that there is in the United States and with all the budget constraints, it's going to be virtually impossible for the United States to counter these Russian moves. And besides, geography makes it obvious that just as the Chinese will dominate the regions around their own coastlines, so the Russians will dominate the regions around their own borders. Barack Obama, no less, once put it very well. He said that in a place like Ukraine, the Russians will always have escalatory dominance over the United States. And that's indeed what he said in 2016. And of course, it's going to become even more the case in a couple of years' time. And it's going to be even more the case with China in a couple of years' time with Taiwan the South and the South and East China Seas. And of course, there are also fundamental shifts in the world economy. The Russians have invested and are enthusiasts in blockchain technologies, which they see as a mechanism for circumventing Western sanctions. They've anyway reorganized their economy to make it essentially sanctions proof. And in fact, it's been doing rather well this year. China has also started to take measures which seem to me intended to make the Chinese economy sanctions proof as well. And we're going to see, I suspect, more developments on that front too. So given that this is so, in the mid 2020s, perhaps the late 2020s, the United States is going to face a commitment crisis. At that point, what does it do? Does it negotiate on the much steeper terms that the Russians and the Chinese will impose? Does it go to war? Does it try to keep up with the Chinese and the Russians and face the risk of systems collapse? Well, I don't know what it's going to do. As I said, little chance of much negotiation or much give now. But the fact remains, and this is the point I'm just going to finish with, and which I've made before, if the United States wants to engage with the Russians and the Chinese, the optimal time to do it is now. In a few years' time, the window will close. And the, at that point, any price that the Russians and the Chinese exact from the United States for strategic stability, that quest that we hear so much about, will be extremely steep and more than the United States might be happy to pay. Well, I discussed the implications of this Chinese hypersonic glide vehicle test at extraordinary length in multiple programmes, in three programmes now on this channel. I think that this is probably the last programme I'm going to do on this topic, at least for a while. But you never know. I suspect we're going to be hearing a great deal more soon about all sorts of other Chinese and indeed Russian military and technology developments. 
And let me reiterate that all the indications are that the Chinese and the Russians are now working together intensively all the time. I should say that I propose to do more programmes about some of the polit politics and the international issues behind all of this uh, for our Locals platform. Um, so if you wanted to see what I've been going to be discussing there, I think you should go and join us. It's very easy to do. You'll find the link under this video. One program I do intend to do at some point, which I anticipate I will be publishing as on Locals as an exclusive, is I'd like to address this issue, which I believe is a myth that China and Russia are two countries that are destined to be rivals and adversaries and enemies, and that this is apparent, supposedly the history of their relations and that it's what they will always be and always come back to and that all that the United States needs to do is sit back and wait until the day eventually comes when the Russians have their, the epiphany and realise the enormous threat the Chinese pose to them and decide to come begging for help from the United States. I think that's an absolute fantastic idea. I think it has no basis in fact at all. I think it is based on a profound misreading, a completely wrong reading of the very long history of Russian-Chinese interaction, which by the way goes back to the 17th century. But it's a topic, an enormous topic, which as I said did, did requires a programme by itself and that program I anticipate is one that I'm eventually going to do on the locals platform where I like to do I'm going to be doing more historical pieces with a geopolitical obviously uh, uh, connection more programs like that anyway join us on locals join us also on our other platforms BitChute, Library, Rumble, Odyssey, and of course also SuperU, the, uh, another new platform about which we have the highest and most interesting thoughts. Also join us on our main channel, The Duran, where I do programs with my colleague and friend Alex Christoforu. And please also join us too on... Um, please also remember to check out Alex's channel, you'll find links under this video. Apologies, by the way, for the sudden barking of the dogs. And um, re please remember to join us, to if you want to support us, to support us by going to our shop, buying the amazing things that you will find there, via, uh, uh, looking us up, supporting us via Patreon and Subscribestar. And also, um, um, if you wish, you can, ha you can support us um, um, through other means and do check your subscription to this channel and remember to press the like button on this video and thank you again for joining me today and I look forward to you joining me again shortly. Good day.